this is going to be a really uh, kind of brief uh, overview of, of pastured poultry. It's kind of broken into two halves. Uh, and this is dense. This has got uh, portions of three different modules from the course in it. So what I really kind of wanted to show were the two halves in the first section. We're going to take a, a real close look at, you know, why you might want to consider uh, pastured poultry, the pros and the cons, the financial impact, your potential earnings on just one acre of ground uh, in, in nine weeks. I think oftentimes we're talking about livestock. People assume you have to have tons and tons and tons of acreage. And while that's true to some extent, if you're talking about bigger animals like cattle with poultry and with pigs um, and a lot of other animals actually you can really do a lot on a small bit of acreage and then in the second half we're going to take a, a real uh, basic overview on the how-to uh, so brooder requirements and hear me if you if you don't get anything else out of this brooder management is so key to pasture poultry production like you've got to have really good brooder management and that that comes in time it comes with experience but it's super important to the bottom line. So when you see all these numbers and profitability, know that like that's the result of good brooder management and, and good pasture management, but specifically brooder. We'll cover feed, water, and grit. We'll take a look at stocking density for both the brooder and in the field. Um, pasture management, maintenance, uh, at transportation to the butcher, and even selecting a butcher. We'll talk a little bit about that. So here's section one. Again, gonna take a really close look at these pros and cons. This is something a lot of people don't do. This is something I teach a lot on, uh, you know, looking at the pros and cons of any enterprise. We've had a lot of people walk into the in-person workshop we've done and, and they walked in saying, you know, well, my first enterprise is gonna be X. And by the time they walk out of that workshop, you know, Enterprise X is not one, not two, but three, because they've looked at the pros and cons. Um, we're gonna cover production costs to get started. Uh, we'll look at the retail pricing that my farm uses for pasture poultry. You're gonna see my actual pricing sheet, like if you were to walk up and buy something at the farmer's market, these are the prices we get every week. Uh, we'll take a really close examination at my income and expenses from a batch of birds that we finished in October of 2017. And what I want to demonstrate with that is that the, the proof that you can make about $10,000 or more net, not gross, net on an acre of ground with pastured poultry. Uh, one thing I want to caution you on, though, is while that looks really good and it sounds easy, getting to a point of, of profitability like that, it's gonna take some time. And that is going to come as you build your marketing list and as you uh, grow your enterprise and can get your economies of scale up. And the economies of scale are gonna be very evident here in just a minute when we look at that slide. So let's take a look at the pros of pasture poultry. First and foremost, this is a very easy animal to manage. If you don't have any livestock experience, and 12 years ago, I didn't. Um, I was, you know, frankly scared to death to start anything with animals because even though I grew up on a farm, by the time I was about five or six, all the animals were gone. So chickens, not scary. Like as human beings, we're way bigger than a chicken. So, you know, they're, they're not, not huge. Um, they, they really can't hurt you in any way. Very low initial capital investment cost compared to any other livestock operation. Um, they're pretty low risk animal. I mean, sure, you're going to have a few losses along the way, but generally speaking, if you follow a recipe like I teach or like, you know, some other people out there teach, pretty low risk in terms of uh, death loss and, and production. Uh, there's no permanent infrastructure required. I didn't have any permanent infrastructure. I had a book and some ideas and $600. That's what I started my farm with was about 600 bucks and one chicken tractor and a book. Um, Five to 600 birds only require about one acre of ground. Again, that, that slide I'm gonna show you where we show $10,000 in profit. That was with 500 birds. I could really get 600 birds on an acre, so you could actually increase that a little bit. Um, very fast ROI. The chicken, um, you know, is comparable to uh, a lot of things that veg guys do in that it's about a 60-ish you know, day product to raise and you can turn around and recycle that money 
into growing that enterprise or into different enterprises, that's pretty quick in the animal world, eight to nine weeks. You get the added benefit of free nitrogen on your pasture. And at some point, you're gonna put down so much nitrogen, you will be forced to either mow that grass, make hay with that grass, uh, or go get some ruminants, uh, get some cattle. So this is you know, something that kind of starts to, to step into a cattle enterprise. It offers even the youngest among us the opportunity to be involved. When I started farming, my oldest son, Ethan, was only about four years of age. It was something that he and I could go out and do together. Yes, it made it slower, but, you know, it's, it's take your kid to work day every day. There are a lot of things that he could go help me with. He enjoyed spending time with his dad. I got to teach him some things. So that's a, that's a real big pro in my book. Um, while we're not going to talk about turkeys today, because I just, I don't have time. Um, we talk about turkeys in the course, but I'm not going to talk about turkeys here. Just know that all of the equipment and the knowledge will function stack into a turkey enterprise. So everything you're going to purchase, build, learn, use, translates very, very well into adding turkeys at some point in the future into your farm business. I'll take a look at some of the cons because this is, you know, not um, one thing I, I, I don't do is I, I don't, you know, paint, paint unrealistic rosy pictures for you. This is something that definitely requires scale to optimize the potential financial earnings. Look, I started with 50 birds, then I went to 100 birds, then 150 and so on, and finally got to a point where I was getting up, you know, four or 500 per batch. And again, you'll see in the spreadsheet why that's so important. It takes time to get there. Just have the right outlook on that. Uh, this is pretty labor intensive. You've got to go out and take care of these guys two to three times a day, seven days a week. Um, that's in the brooder or out in the pasture. And, you know, moving chicken tractors is work. Uh, you know, lifting grain buckets is work. Loading chickens into chicken crates and loading those crates up onto a trailer is work. It's hard physical labor. Um, the uh, product that we're, we're making here, compared to the, the conventional food equivalent, if we walk into Walmart, our, our product is three to 400% higher than that conventional chicken. It's about double for organic. I mean, you can walk into Trader Joe's and get an organic bird for $249 to $299 a pound. My birds are, are $499 and I'm not certified organic. That's definitely a disadvantage in the marketplace. Butchers can be pretty daggone difficult to locate, and sometimes they're pretty far away. My butcher is almost 90 miles each direction. Each batch of chicken is two trips, one to take the birds over and uh, drop them off and one to go uh, pick them back up. Again, that's why scale is so important. We've, we've got to amortize those fixed costs over more chickens to get our, uh, our profitability up. This is pretty seasonal. I've got about a six to seven month window here. Some regions you might get nine months uh, down in the south. I've got um, a guy that's uh, been to two of the workshops we've done here, Wilson Marsh. I mean, he is way down in southern Texas. He actually shuts down production for about three months in the summer because it's too hot to raise the birds. So this isn't something we can do year round. That means if we want to do this full time, if that's our goal, we've got to plan things out. We've got to be able to cash flow. 12 months of product into a six to nine month production window. That can be a very difficult thing to juggle. I've figured out how to do that, but it's not easy. These guys are also extremely influenced by weather uh, and they're really volatile. If it gets really hot and humid or if it's cold and rainy, they have a tough time. Not, not going to lie to you. Um, they can be really difficult to manage during those times and you have to take some extreme measures to take care of. Now here we're going to take a look at um, the cost analysis, and this is uh, one of the spreadsheets you'd see in the online course. These are some older numbers, but this will just kind of give you an idea. On the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see our 21% uh, starter ration we put together. Uh, this is three years ago. Cost is almost 29 cents a pound delivered. That's if we're buying it in bulk. This is three to four tons at a time. Again, you're going to start smaller scale. Your numbers are going to be higher. Your costs are going to be higher. Uh, and then our grower out on, on pasture, 19% protein was about 27 cents a pound. And then over on the right, what I really want to demonstrate here is scale. So the, the top right, that's 500 birds, okay? And then the bottom right is 400 birds. 
and we've got all of our costs over on the, the right hand side. That's just showing you our, our estimate. Again, it's an estimate of our, our total production costs and our cost per bird um, to you know get these guys butchered and uh, in a in a place where we can sell them. We're assuming a 4.5 pound average. Um, and back then we were selling these guys for 475 a pound. Um, but I always plan on a 10% death loss. If you're wondering why those numbers look a little bit different when you get to the bottom, our cost per bird really isn't that much different if you look at it. But if you look at our profit, we, we go from $5,000 on the top right down to $4,000 on the bottom right. And that's because of our fixed costs and our time. Our time is barely any more to take care of 500 chickens than it is 400 chickens. And if you look, I, I really do shoot for $50 an hour. That's what that dollars per hour on the bottom right is. That's what I'm paying myself per hour on my labor with anything I do. And that's, that's what I teach. I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, there are some other rules of thumb that I teach on. And what, but one of them is I want to shoot for $50 an hour on my production labor. Now that's not marketing. That's not, you know, driving to the farmer's market. I, I, I cover all that in, in another section, but on my production on farm, I'm shooting for 50 bucks an hour. And something I learned years ago on economies of scale, all those hours getting dressed, going out to the breeder, getting dressed, going out to the field, loading the chickens, hauling the chickens, picking the chickens up. That really affects your bottom line when you start talking about numbers. And it, seriously, like you, you drop down to 40 bucks an hour just by raising 400 birds versus 500 birds. And that's really what I want you to get out of this slide is you've got to have a long-term goal with poultry to really get your, your scalability up. I talk with a lot of people and they say, well, we're going to do uh, four, four batches of, you know, 125 birds. And my advice is invest in the chicken tractors, invest in the crates, invest in the feeders and the waterers and do one batch of 500 because your profitability will skyrocket. And now you're only working eight weeks or nine weeks out of the year instead of 32 or 36 weeks. So just keep that in mind long-term. You're not going to get there on day one, and that's fine. We all start at, you know, ground zero and work our way up. But scalability, economies of scale, really plays a huge, huge role in how productive your poultry enterprise can be. Now, here is just a quick look at our pricing. Whole chickens, $4.99 a pound. Uh, boneless breast, $10.99 a pound. Yes, we get $10.99 a pound for chicken breast. Leg quarters, six bucks. Wings, five bucks. Chicken feet. We just got to start keeping those about a year ago in the state of Indiana. Um, we swing for the fences, um, seven bucks a pound. We sell them. Uh, livers and hearts, five dollars a pound. Chicken frames, that's the leftover, that's the neck, back, tail, rib section, three forty-nine a pound. Those do take some effort to sell, but once you can get people to make their own stock, they're hooked. They will come back for more. But again, it does take time to get people, you know, to that point. Now, th this is a, um, uh, a slide I put together to show what our initial thoughts were on uh, a batch of birds, like what we thought we, were, we, should, we should make, um, assuming we were on the left-hand side, assuming we're selling everything as just a whole chicken. Uh, but we don't do that. We sell, as you just saw, things parted out. We sell a lot of those cuts at the farmer's market. Not everybody wants to cook with a whole chicken. Uh, there's an ebb and a flow to selling whole chickens and, and stuff by the piece. But what I want to point out on the slide on the left is our total production cost for this batch of birds was, um, call it 5,600 bucks. You see that 55, 60, 89 there. So our, our, we finished 486 birds. So our cost per bird was 1144. Um, our production costs have gone up from that previous slide you saw just a couple of minutes ago. But I'm normally shooting for about four and a half, maybe 4.75 pounds per bird. Well, I ran these birds about three or four days longer. I ran them on a little higher protein. I was able to get away with that because we were doing it in the fall. And there are a lot of reasons why you can, you know, get bigger chickens in the fall versus in the spring. Um, but 
the short story is we got these guys to hit 5.6 pounds and we actually got our, our cost per pound down to $2 and four cents. And we had, you know, uh, uh, 2,725 pounds of product. Now, if, if we, if we take that, we multiply it times 4.99 a pound, you see that 13,597. So we show our profit there's $8,000. Our money factor, that's something I talk a lot about is, you know, what's our money factor, our X factor. I always want to at least 2X my money. So if I put in $5,000, I wanna make sure I've got $10,000 coming back. That for me in my system with the amount of labor that I put into everything really tends to work out very, very well for hitting that $50 an hour. That's, uh, I'm big on using spreadsheets uh, as a guide and then going back occasionally and actually inputting all the data like I've done here, you know, to see if we're hitting the mark. And uh, because these birds were bigger, that 5.6 pounds, we actually got our money factor up to, to almost 2.5. And these are real numbers, guys. That profit per hour on my labor is 102.5 man hours was over $78 an hour. But here's the thing I want to show you on the right hand side. If we take and we retail, you know, some number of these birds that I put in 1,635 pounds, that's about how many uh, pounds of whole bird we had come back. We part everything else out. We can actually increase our profitability. In this case, $2,000. You see that net profit down there at the bottom, that's 99, 49, 36. I actually took, my, my butcher gives me everything back. They write everything down and they'll tell me, okay, you had X packages of chicken breast and this was the average. You had X whole chickens and this was the average. So these are all real numbers, me putting this into a spreadsheet. And my net profit on this group of birds was 99.49. And I just told you a minute ago, I can actually crank it up a little bit. So if I would have started 600 birds instead of 550, we would have been well over $10,000. And that's, that's one acre of ground in the Midwest, okay? My money factor was pushing 2.8, but look at the profit per hour. Again, on my labor, 97 bucks an hour. Now, are these results normal? No, not always, but they are definitely possible. These are the things you have to figure out using Excel, putting together a spreadsheet to really see where the sweet spots are. I can tell you, running 500 birds at a time, I don't want to see anything below 4.5 pounds because then I'm not hitting my 50 bucks an hour. And again, that's just on whole chickens. If I can retail everything though, and I can have a, you know, a, a really nice batch of birds and typically in the fall here is when they finish better, we can really swing for the fences and make some serious, serious money on pasture and poultry. Now there don't get too excited. There is a saturation point. I mean, you can only retail so many chickens, you know, at these prices at some point, you saturate your network and you'll have to start wholesaling uh, some of the birds through a, through a CSA or to stores and restaurants. So that's going to, you know, put a pretty big dent in your numbers. But again, I just want to demonstrate that on an acre of ground, it really is possible to go out and make 10,000 um, bucks with a, a little more than a hundred hours in labor. Now you still got to do all your marketing, of course, but, you know, look, it, even if you spend another hundred hours marketing all this, which you, you probably won't, um, you know, you're, <laughs> you're still making 50 bucks an hour and that's really good money. Now we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and get into section two. And again, we're going to be uh, going through just some of the basics, you know, for raising pasture poultry. And, you know, if you've already raised some birds, a lot of this may seem kind of elementary to you, but if you uh, just kind of started dabbling with it, um, you know, maybe you've raised 50 birds or 100 birds. I think there's probably a lot you're going to learn here. Again, I can't uh, really, you know, do this uh, justice in an hour to try and, and teach you everything that you, you know, you'd see in the, like the, the in-person workshop or the, the course online. But we're, we're going to hit a lot of the highlights so you have a really good idea. If you've never done anything, this is a very good starting point. Uh, some very good lessons here to keep you from getting in trouble. So. Uh, we'll talk about selecting a hatchery. There's actually a free blog, blog article on this on the grassfedlife.co website. Uh, just some tips and tricks for selecting a hatchery to improve your chances for success. Uh, your brooder space, equipment, uh, both in the brooder and in the field, uh, you know, our feed water grip, pasture management, and again, transporting to the butcher. Um, there's a free video 
and a free guide, two different things. There's a video in, uh, at farmbusinessessentials.com that's free where you'll see us, you know, with the chickens all loaded up and like what that looks like. Because it, it's really something to see, you know, 500 and some birds loaded up and in transit to the butcher. Gives you an idea of what scalability looks like. Uh, and then there's a free guide on selecting a butcher. Um, that, like, there's a lot that really needs to go into that because you don't want to put all this work into raising these animals. And, you know, then get to a, a, a butcher that does a lousy job. And I've had that happen the very first time I, I took my pigs somewhere. I mean, they did a really lousy job. They didn't treat my animals well. My customers weren't happy. I actually lost some customers. And I, you know, had to reset things. I had to go out and find a different butcher to use that would do a better job. And I talk a lot about this. Um, you know, on the podcast, we've talked about this. I talked this a, a lot about this and in the teaching I do. A butcher is an extension of your farm, whether you like it or not. They represent you to your customers, particularly if your customers have to go there to, to, to pick something up. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, again, that guide's free. It's only about three pages long, but man, there, there's a whole lot of uh, wisdom in that thing that will help you avoid landmines with picking a butcher. So uh, first thing, try and find a hatchery that's going to get your chicks to you within a maximum of two nights. Again, reference that blog article. That it really explains why that is so, so important. Uh, then we've got to keep these day-old chicks at 95 degrees for the first week. And after they're a week old, we want to start to slowly reduce the heat over the next couple of weeks. I liken baby chicks to tomato plants. You can't just take a tomato plant from indoors or a greenhouse and go straight outside. You've got, you've got to harden it off. You've got to toughen it up. And that's kind of what we're doing with the chicks. The brooder should be a really super cozy, happy place for the baby chicks. And they're all warm and they got it easy. They're on easy street. Um, so we, we've got to start to kind of, you know, rough them up a little bit as we get ready to take them outside so that they won't get shell shock when we take them out there. 0.25 square foot per chick in the brooder, maximum stocking density. That works really, really well up to about two and a half to three weeks. If for some reason you think they'll be in the brooder longer than three weeks, you need to increase your total square footage so that you'll have ample room. Stick with that number. That's a very good rule of thumb to use. Uh, I, I'd say early on, even to a point of scalability up to five, 600 birds, that works really, really well. So this is a, a picture of the inside of my brooder um, right after I rebuilt it a few years ago. It's no longer that, that clean and, and pretty and pristine. Um, but what I did was I, I framed and insulated a box inside of an existing building. This was an old chicken coop. I insulated the exterior walls and then framed up, as you can see, there a two foot tall wall. That's where the chicks are at. We can cover them up put the heat lamps down in there, keep them all nice and toasty warm uh, so that, you know, they get a really good start on things. It's particularly important early, early in the season if you start birds in March or April. Uh, the other thing you want to make sure about your brooder is that you need to have ventilation. So you need some flaps uh, that you can open and close. Air should move through the brooder, but you don't want it to actually hit the birds directly, particularly early in the year when it's really cold. So they need ventilation, but again, not air directly on them. I've got a combination of flaps, doors. I take this insulation on, off, turn heat lamps on and off. I'm three times a day, four times a day. I'm in that brooder looking at them and really making good management decisions so that we get really nice birds out on pasture. Uh, bedding. You can use sawdust from a local mill if you want to. I've taken to just using, you know, the, the bagged, um, kiln dry, uh, kiln, kiln dried pine shavings from the farm store. It's like four dollars and fifty cents for a bag. I've just got a line item back in those those uh, that cost analysis I showed you earlier. It's like sixty seventy bucks for a batch of five six hundred birds. I just don't have time to go shovel sawdust. That's what I did early on when I had oh, I had six hundred dollars to start with. Okay, I went and shoveled sawdust, but it was like you know, three hours to go get a load of sawdust. Uh, whereas now I can go to the farm store and be home in 30 minutes. And, you know, once your scale gets bigger, your time becomes so, so precious. And two and a half hours, uh, you know, to, to save, you know, $50 or something, just, it just really wasn't worth it for me long-term. 
Uh, we've got to keep these guys warm and dry. Moisture and cold are a young bird's enemy. That will give you all kinds of problems. So for feed, uh, use a finely ground 21% protein mix or as recommended by your hatchery. Different hatcheries have different strains of birds. So you can't just say, well, I saw in this webinar to go use 21% protein. The strain of birds you're getting may be different. So ask them, you know, what protein and for how long? I use about 21, 22% for the first three weeks of age uh, while they're in the brooder. And the other thing you want to be sure to do is to add grit every time you feed them. I put it in layers. I'll put in some feed, grit, feed, grit. So, you know, the guys who show up first get grit. The guys who show up second get grit. Grit is super important to get the gizzards of the birds going. Uh, you will have problems if you don't give them enough grit. Um, you can feed them, you know, creek sand if it's fine, uh, finally, uh, you know, small particles. That's an option, but really, you know, you need to buy some grit to give them. We used a small crushed granite. Now, uh, while they're in the brooder, I just use a, a simple one gallon water. Uh, you want to be sure to, you know, rinse it and refill it at least once a day early on, even though they may not drink at all. Um, try and check on the birds at least twice a day. I, I check on them morning, noon, and night. Um, and, you know, look, a few dead birds should be expected in the first three to four days. That's just kind of the way it is. There's shipping stress. You get the weak ones. Uh, you're going to have a few losses. I think anything the first three to four days, you know, it's, it just, it is what it is. Personally, after day four, maybe day five, at that point, it's on me. Normally, though, most hatcheries are going to send you an extra two to three percent on your order to compensate for shipping stress and some losses in the mail. Now, first week in the brooder, this is what I use, uh, a little Brower uh, plastic feeder. I take that top off. I don't like it. You, you know, you'd have to fill that stupid thing every couple of hours to make it so the chicks can get access to the feed. So I take that off. Do they waste a little bit of feed? Yes, they will waste a little bit of feed, but these are little Ferraris. They've got to have access to the fuel they need to grow. So take the top off. You're only going to use it seven days maximum. If you've got really good brooder management, a lot of times I'll pull these at day five, day six, because they're big enough they can get to the next feeder, which is this guy. This is a metal feeder, uh, galvanized metal. I use this from week one through week three in, in the brooder. Uh, you're going to need the additional length to facilitate the same number of birds as they grow. Having enough feeder space so that enough birds can belly up to the bar at one time is really important. Again, they will get stressed, and stress is our enemy. That's what we're trying to avoid. They will get stressed if they can't get up to the feeder and eat enough feed to grow properly. Now, uh, once you're uh, out on pasture, you can use a Bellmatic waterer like this. I hooked this to a five gallon bucket. Uh, this is uh, from Cool Corporation. They've been pretty solid, and they've got a couple little things that, you know, can can go wrong, but all in all, these work really, really well. Uh, and you can, again, you can use these for the turkeys also. Now, once you're out on pasture, you're gonna wanna get a larger capacity feeder. This is a Brower Real Feeder. Um, again, there's a blog article on this on the Grass Fed Life website. I would encourage you to read that. I explain why this is so important. These things are, number one, expensive, and number two, they will pay for themselves. That's always a litmus test for equipment. If it's expensive, that's okay if it's going to pay for itself in time, and these absolutely do pay for themselves. Um, I do suggest one ad, you, you add a lag bolt for the handle because they send these little weenie screws and they will fail eventually. They'll last longer in the four footer than they will the five footer. Uh, so you can use them initially if you want, but know that in time you're gonna need to put a big lag bolt in there to keep that handle secure. Um, Stocking density out on, on pasture, you need about one and a third to one and a half square feet per bird. So here's our birds out on pasture. Uh, it's gonna take about eight to nine weeks to get them done, like I mentioned earlier. And again, you gotta be sure that they've got plenty of feeder space. You can see here, we've got two feeders in there for about 90 chickens. Um, a good rule of thumb when you're trying to forecast your expenses it, on your grain is you get, need about two pounds of grain to one pound of gain live weight. That's in a, a grass-based system where you're moving the birds every day and they get some of their intake from the grass. Your meat broilers are going to dress out roughly 70% from live weight. So you can look at some charts and kind of get some ideas 
about how many days you think that's going to take. I run all my birds eight and a half to nine weeks, depending on the time of year. And that works really, really well for us with our feed and our system and our climate. Uh, you're probably not going to vary from that a whole lot, but you may have to vary from it a little bit to, uh, you know, to get to that point, use that 70% to work the math backwards. If you feel like you've got to get five pounds on your broilers to make this worthwhile, just make sure that you allow enough time to get them up to a live weight. So that's where they'll dress out at. Now we, uh, we move our tractors using a two wheel dolly and I, I buy a good dolly. It's about 70, 75 bucks. It's made in the United States. It's Milwaukee brand, heavy duty. Um, and we have our broilers out on pasture for about five to six weeks. Why this is important is you've got to make sure you've got enough space out there for your chicken tractors. You need to multiply the length of your tractor, you know, by the number of days that they're going to be on pasture and, and determine if you've got the area needed uh, so that you've got enough room. You don't want to run out of room and hit a fence or a tree line or something else. You know, my tractors are pretty, pretty good size, kind of heavy. Uh, they stand up to a lot of abuse and they stand up to storms really, really well. That's why I like them. It's why I built them, but they're not super easy to turn. So I always try and plan ahead and make sure I've got enough space to uh, get my birds done and, and not run out of pasture. Now here are some uh, uh, tips for transporting to the butcher. There's a lot of ask me how I know in here, uh, a lot of mistakes and errors over the years. Um, you know, first thing, remove feed from your broilers at noon, the day before butchering. Your butcher will really appreciate that. Uh, you will also really appreciate that when you go to load them because they make a lot uh, smaller mess. But you definitely want to keep plenty of water in front of them. You want these guys hydrated uh, so that when you go to load them, again, they're not stressed. I mean, we're really, we're taking, if we're talking about a Cornish cross chicken, you know, we're, we're taking a bird that was designed to live indoors and we're, we're putting them out in the elements. So anything we can do to avert stress, that's what we want to do. Um, don't place more than nine to 10 birds in a coop 12 style crate. And if you're wondering what that is, you can look it up. That's a cool corporation crate. That's what I have on my farm. Um, you've got to be, you know, uh, careful with that, putting too many of them in there. They can actually suffocate. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of a tough thing to have happen. You want to load as late in the day or evening as possible. If you're not hauling to the next morning, uh, we always, always load the evening before. I have loaded at three o'clock in the morning once uh, due to extreme heat and a drought in the middle of the summer back in 2012. Getting help to load chickens at two or three in the morning uh, let's just say I've got some really good friends that, that bailed me out that came over and helped me do that. That's, that's pretty insane. They are easier to catch. There is less stress on them. It's just difficult to get help at that time. That's why I always do it the night before. Um, and, and we've learned some things we can do to make that easier for them so they don't stress out. Uh, if you're using an enclosed livestock trailer, and this is an ask me how I know, Open all the doors and provide box fans to keep them as cool as possible. You want to keep the air moving. Uh, make certain there's no hay or straw in the trailer when you put those crates in there. They can overheat and die. Don't stack the crates all the way to the roof. They can overheat and die. Spread the crates out. Make all your stacks even. Uh, it's really better if you can get an open trailer and use ratchet straps or you know, whatever to uh, uh, secure them to the trailer. An open trailer just allows for so much more ventilation. These guys really put off a lot of heat when you, you put them in those, those uh, crates and, and get them ready to go to the butcher. Again, there's a free video on the transportation inside the uh, Farm Business Essentials course. And again, you can download that free guide on selecting a butcher. I've already talked about that. It's just a really good resource for you. Um, Make certain to coordinate your butchering dates and your hatching, hatchery dates ahead of time. Uh, I always call and schedule my hatchery dates first. Then, um, or I'm sorry, I get my butchering dates scheduled first. Then I call the hatchery. I work backwards and, and schedule everything from there because I, the last thing you want to do is raise a batch of birds and not have a butchering date eight to nine weeks in the future. Butchers can get really, really busy during peak production, and uh, don't be surprised if you do that. You might call, it might be, ah, oh, well, we can't get you in two weeks from today. It's going to be five weeks from today. Well, then you're going to have a 12-week-old bird. 
and you're probably gonna have a bird that's seven to eight pounds and it's gonna be really difficult to sell seven or eight pound whole chicken. So keep that in mind. Uh, there's a blog article and actually there's a whole podcast on planning your season ahead uh, out on grassfedlife.co. Would encourage you to uh, read that article, listen to that podcast. There's a, a, a lot of good tips and tricks and hacks in both of those. So some basic equipment costs. You're probably wondering, okay, what's all this gonna cost, right? Chicken tractor, depending on the design and the materials. Could be 200 bucks, could be 350 bucks. This is something you don't wanna skimp out on. My chicken tractors have lasted eight, nine, 10 seasons. So yeah, they cost me $300 to build all those years ago, but when you amortize that out, I mean, $30 a year for a chicken tractor is nothing. It's $2.50 a month. Uh, it's just, it's not even worth amateurizing it over the number of chickens that run through it. I know some guys will do that. I don't. Uh, I think it's silly if you build something that's going to last that long. It's really, really cheap to use. So do the math based on stocking density to know how many you're going to need to run a batch. And I have batch in quotes there because you're going to determine what your batch size is. My suggestion is, you know, look, start with 100 birds. Uh, the chicken tractor I use, you can put 100 birds in it. If you want to build a Suscovich style tractor, you're going to need two or three of those tractors. Now they're a lot lighter, uh, but you're going to have, a, you're going to have more money in them. Uh, but again, they're easier to move. They're easier on the back. Uh, so that you've got to think about the holistic context. Who's moving the birds every day, you know, uh, or is one person doing it six days a week and somebody else doing it that seventh day? Well, you need to build the tractor so that the smallest person physically that's going to be involved can move it. Your two old dolly, 70 bucks, your small waterers, a little one gallon fonts I showed you there, seven bucks. You can figure out how many of these you need. I've, I've got all these numbers in here for you. So if you've got 500 birds, you're going to need five of those. Uh, the large water with five gallon bucket, each one of those setups is going to be about $30. Small plastic feeders, I think are four bucks. The medium metal feeders, 25, maybe a little bit more. They're worth it. They last for a really long time. Again, one per uh, 100 birds. The large uh, brower feeders, those are the four footers are like $65 each. They've actually come down in price. Trust me, they're worth it. Read the blog article I mentioned. Buy those feeders if you're going to do this. They're so worthwhile. Transport crates, $60 a piece. $60 a piece. Yes, I personally own 54 of those. It's over $3,000 in chicken crates. It's one of the big negatives to this. It's a one-use piece of equipment. It's expensive, but it's the cost of doing business. That's just, it is what it is. It's the cost of doing business. If you're going to do this right, you need good crates. I have treated my crates poorly and I'm being generous. And those things are 10, 11 years old and they're still ticking. Uh, they sit outside, I don't put them in a barn. They're fine. I mean, they are built heavy, built to last. They're worth the money. And again, yes, $60, but over 10, 11, 12 years, you're talking $5 a year. Uh, your brooder lamps and bulbs, you get about $20 uh, per each setup. Uh, your brooder cost is gonna vary. If you've got an existing building, uh, you can start these guys a uh, small scale in a cardboard box in your garage. Be careful with the heat lamps and cardboard, obviously a fire hazard. Um, it really just depends. I repurposed an old building that wasn't doing anything else. It was just sitting there. I was fortunate. That's an unfair advantage. I had it on my farm already. I didn't have to build it. Um, and then optional, if you want to use an energizer and some portable netting or single hot wire for predator protection, you can. Um, I personally don't do that. Um, we just block our pins really well so that nothing can get in, nothing can get out. But again, that would be an additional cost you'd have to consider. Now, to learn more, uh, I've mentioned the Grass Fed Life website to you. Hopefully you guys are aware of that. Everything on that site is free. Uh, that is our way of giving back. Um, there is a free weekly podcast. Uh, there are a lot of free blog articles out there. There's more blog articles coming. Uh, last week, Diego wrote um, a blog article slash uh, short thesis on, on starting a farm-based business. Uh, it's like 12 pages. It's an excellent read. Uh, I've been self-employed full-time since 2010. Um, I've been uh, farming since 2007. I learned a few things to implement in, in reading that article. It's really, really good. And one of the number one questions we get is like, how do I go about starting a farm business? That's why there's a whole nother webinar 
on starting a farm-based business and insurance and legalities and structure and accounting and bookkeeping and all that stuff. Uh, so check that out. That's, that's on the website. It's free. Uh, there's links to all this suggested equipment uh, that I just covered out there. Um, you can go out, look at that, see what you think. I mean, this is the stuff I use. I don't recommend anything I don't use. I don't take any endorsements or get paid anything to recommend that. I've never been given any equipment for free. It's just stuff I buy and use and like. Stuff I don't like, I'm not going to tell you to go buy it. I'm not going to waste your time. Uh, something else we've started recently, our Facebook page. We put a lot of stuff out there, put the podcast out there weekly, some other articles of interest, uh, things like this webinar. So you can go out on Facebook and, and follow us there. Um, if you're serious about farming, Diego mentioned early on, like we've, we've put together the Farm Business Essentials online course and uh, you got a link to the website there. Um, you know, specifically for pasture poultry, if you, if you take that, there's a complete equipment list. There are field videos and instructions, you know, showing you how to raise these guys from start to finish. And again, earn 10,000 bucks an acre. Uh, there's 45 minutes just on brooder management on the field video. And then there's brooder management in the lecture module as well, because it's so incredibly important. It took me about three or four years to finally figure out brooder management. And it is the single biggest thing with pasture poultry. If you don't do a good job there, they're just going to struggle. Uh, that's why we spent so much time in that course covering that. Uh, there's an entire module dedicated to setting prices and selecting retail cuts. That's another question we got a whole lot. Uh, we actually added a whole section into the, uh, the in-person workshop that ended up going into the online course uh, just on those things because people really struggle with that. I struggled with it. I think that's one of the best modules out there, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I go through over 10 different methods that we sell stuff uh, from our farm. The, there's no theory. This course is zero theory, zero, I think this might maybe work. Uh, you get a certificate at the end to put on the wall. Nope, that's not how we roll. This is all, you know, real world proven strategies. That's what I'm all about. I'm an engineer by trade. So if it's not pragmatic and useful, I'm not into it. Uh, we got spreadsheets. You kind of saw a sample of those um, at the beginning, you know, showing you how to charge the right price for your stuff so you can earn that 50 bucks an hour. Uh, you get direct access to myself via the Facebook group and uh, member only webinars. Uh, and then, you know, the course in total, there's 23 modules out there. Uh, everything you need to start, run, and succeed with a farm business. There's marketing, business setup, branding, spreadsheets, production, time management, infrastructure, animal management. I, I can't even really, it's over 25 hours and it's growing. So you can go out and check that out um, and see what you think. Um, and that's, that's really all I've got on this. So I'll turn this back over to Diego. So this is, this is the Farm Business Essentials site. This is where the course is. This is what's taken up a lot of my time over the past few months. That's why I haven't been on YouTube much at all. But if you go to this site, we're still developing. We're adding a lot out. And the goal is to continually add to this into the future. You go to the site and you scroll down to this area right here underneath the, the ticking timer and say what's inside the course, preview the course. You can come here to this page and when it loads, what you'll be able to see is some sample course content for the course itself. Now the course is really twofold in terms of content. We try to approach this in two ways. We tried to show lecture style content and also in the field content. I think a lot of workshops out there, they'd go one or the other. We have a blend of both. So just on this page here, you can see a sample of the lecture style content, which we filmed here, and the in the field stuff, which is actually filmed on Darby's farm while he was in production last summer and last fall. So very current actual stuff how he does it. If you want to see what's inside the course itself, all the lessons and modules, and some of the pre free previews, click on this link here, and then this will take you inside the course to see what's actually out there right now. And there'll be some of these lessons which are actually designated preview, like this one. And any of the ones that have this little 
red preview pill shaped button, you can preview and there's every module within the course that's published so far, there's a preview out there. So you can go view all those and you can see what's inside these. Uh, in terms of the modules themselves, you may be wondering, well, mod why are you starting on module four? Where's one, two, and three? That's what we're in the process of rolling out right now is the other stuff because the stuff that's not out there is the stuff that I'm filming and that'll start coming out next week. I've just been putting this stuff out here and getting this, all the kinks worked out of the website, things like that right now. So expect more modules, modules to start rolling out next week. And then within probably by the end of April, the course will be full in terms of all the content will be out there. And then we'll be looking to add more potentially going forward on subjects that people want to learn more about. I mean, one of the lags on my content is I'm redoing and building out some of the modules that I did in the in-person workshop to add more because we've gotten a lot of questions like this whole designing a farm-based business or setting up a farm-based business, which is the webinar for Saturday. Like that model has grown from something that was relatively small in person to something that's going to be pretty dense in this. So what Darby and I have done is we've made the, the course itself right now, we're calling it an early bird. So between now and next Tuesday, you can get it for $7.99, 200 bucks off. After the early bird runs out, it goes to $9.99. It's not coming back down. There won't be sales or anything like that. It'll be $9.99. The discount is really to say, hey, we know it's not complete right now. We know we're working out some of the kinks. There's already a lot here, but as an early adopter, you get a discounted price on it. So that's the course itself. If you guys have any questions on that, feel free to reach out and in touch base with me. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. We recently added a payment plan into the mix. So if you think $7.99 is too much, I get it. There's a third party vendor partially that allows you to have a payment plan where you can do payments over three to six months. You pick and it amortizes it out over that. I want to thank everybody for coming. We'll get to questions in a minute. I, I think most of those will be directed at Darby, but I want to thank you for coming. Be sure to come back to the webinar on Saturday, which will be all about forming and organizing your own business. There'll be a lot there. I'm really going to be focusing on the structure, how you structure your business, meaning like entity, sole proprietor, LLC, that type of thing. And Darby will do a small little blurb on farm-based insurance two big things we've gotten a lot of questions about that we really want to address and then stay tuned after this webinar probably tomorrow at some point I'll send out a link where you can view this webinar if you want to re-listen to it I think Darby had a lot of little it, it, a lot came very fast in that so if you want to re-see it or send it to a friend we'd be glad if you did so with that I'll open it up for any questions what you can do if you want to ask a question just down in the chat window below type it down there and I'll relay them to Darby. Or Darby, you can see the chat? Yeah, I can see it. So I see the, the question that popped up here from Dan. Um, okay, so you're wanting to raise broilers on his land. Um, I think, I think um, you know, the way I would approach him, particularly if we don't, you know, we don't want to necessarily pay him anything, you're adding nitrogen uh, to his pasture. And that nitrogen is going to grow a lot of grass. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of trading and bartering. Uh, you know, like I said, literally, I started our business with 600 bucks. We're grossing, you know, $200,000 a year now. Um, and no employees, no employees. Um, you do that by being smart. I borrowed, bartered for a truck. A livestock trailer early on um, you know I rented equipment I, I think it's kind of the same thing here uh, hey neighbor I'd like to raise some birds on your land you know what I'll give you half a dozen chickens you're gonna get some free nitrogen and if you ever need uh, a hand with your cows you let me know would it be okay if I raise 500 chickens out here or whatever it is and define where you're gonna raise those and just kind of define you know that if you need to put up some temporary electric fence to keep his cows out of your chicken tractors, like you'll do that. Um, if there's no money, 
changing hands, I don't think there's any need to have an agreement, but if any money is changing hands, I think a really simple little agreement that you and he both sign would be wise, even if you're only paying him 50 bucks or 100 bucks or something. So that's, that's how I would approach that. Um, why do I prefer the bell water over nipple? I hate nipple waters. I used them once. I think they're still laying in a pile behind one of my barns. Um, they dispensed way too much water. I had the bucket three or four feet above those things and it was too much head pressure. And when the bird would go to drink, a solid stream of water would shoot out. The bell waters just work. They're easy to clean out. I can quickly see if they're working or not. I can step in there, dump it out. Uh, it immediately starts filling back up or it doesn't. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's what works for me. They also double really, really well for turkeys. I don't use a different waterer for turkeys. Uh, the only time I don't use the bell water for the turkeys is when it gets to be freezing and those things will freeze up even sub 38 degrees, 36 degrees, they can have problems. That's when we'll stop using them for the turkeys. Uh, but beyond that, they, they function stack really well. Um, how much of this changes if you're doing layers instead of broilers? Yeah, um, I don't do layers for a reason. It's really difficult to make money on eggs. You've gotta be at a huge scale. Um, I, I have done eggs in the past. The assumption I made with eggs uh, was that it would bring me a lot of new meat customers, and it really didn't. It brought me a lot of vegetarians who were really pissed off when I didn't have eggs for them at, at five minutes before the market closed. <laughs> That's what it brought me. So I think it's scale. It is something that could work. Um, uh, I've got a young man that's going to be setting up shop here this summer, running a couple of complimentary enterprises uh, on our farm, uh, layers being one of them. We took a look at that, running 125 birds, which is not huge, but not small. The, the best we could get his hourly rate up to on those birds was about 22 bucks. And I was beating the crap out of that spreadsheet. Um, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. I think they're very complimentary. I think you gotta be careful. I think there's a lot of other ways to make money faster uh, than, than layers. I think if you've got the time and it's your, you know, fourth or fifth enterprise, then it can start to make sense if you can stack it in nicely and, and really dovetail it into some other things and cut the labor down. Um, get more questions than I can read here. I gotta scroll back up. Okay. Do my tractors also well, work well for turkeys? Yes, they do. We run the turkeys in them. Stocking densities are all different. I didn't have time to cover any of that tonight. I do cover it all in the course. Um, but yeah, they, they work really, really well for the chickens. The chickens move out one day, the turkeys go in the same day. Uh, we've got them already started in some of the other tractors and we spread them out to give them more room. Uh, turkeys are super profitable, super, super profitable. That's something you can really swing for the fence on price if you're only raising them once a year. Uh, we live in a high predator area. Yeah, if you've got that much, Phil, if you've got that much predator pressure, I'm gonna say you need to invest in some portable electric poultry netting from Premier Fence. Um, two things I really like from Premier Fence, they're PRS chargers. There's a link to that on the Grass Fed Life website. Those things flat out work. They're a, uh, they're a tank. They're poultry netting, the 100 foot sections, it's a little bit more expensive. I don't like the 164 foot sections. It's really heavy, it's, it's difficult. I'm, you know, 5'9", 165, 170 pounds, pretty muscular. Anything more than 100 feet, man, it gets heavy. And if you've got somebody else trying to move that stuff on your farm that's not physically big, it's tough. The 100 foot section, I like it for two reasons. One, it's lighter. I get the stuff where it's got the extra posts. Um, we do have a few layers because we eat eggs, okay? We sell the extras, but we've got a couple sections of that stuff for our layers. The double spikes and the extra posts. I think the posts are every uh, eight or 10 feet or, or, or something instead of every 16 feet. That's what I would tell you to buy. Buy a PRS charger or hook it up if it's close enough to external high tensile fence for predator protection. Um, I wouldn't, if it's that high uh, predator uh, issue though, I'd probably get a dedicated uh, PRS 100 charger that's gonna put 10,000 volts on that fence to keep them out. Um, 
As far as the Scovich's uh, tractors, I missed that earlier on small turkey. I don't know. I'm going to build some of John's tractors this year and see how I like them. I don't know how they're going to work for turkeys. I mean, I think they'll work, but the, the downside is the stocking density. That, that's, that's it. You've got to build two and a half of John's tractors for every one of mine. That trade-offs, pluses and minuses each way, that's the downside. Uh, Central Florida zone nine gets really hot. Can't put your pasture on. Uh, no, you can put your birds out earlier. Sometimes I do that. Uh, three weeks is a rule of thumb. Uh, down there, honestly, Justin, I'd be looking, can you brood on pasture? That would be better uh, if, you can, if you can do that. The thing, depending on where you're at, is you're probably not raising birds between June 15th and August 15th. You're probably shutting down production. Uh, I used to have a friend down there, and she raised a lot of poultry, and she took off from Memorial Day till Labor Day. And then she worked the rest of the year. And she was uh, central, north central-ish Florida. Uh, so that's, that's what she did. But no, you could definitely put them out sooner. I put them out as early as two weeks. You've really got to look ahead at the forecast. You don't want to put them out when there's rain forecast, things of that nature, because uh, you can really get in trouble. Uh, ben, you're very welcome. Uh, have I ever considered doing my own breeding? No. I don't do any breeding. The only thing I breed here are cows because cow calf is where the money is long term. I do not feral pigs. I don't. Um, no, no. Too easy to make a phone call and get day old baby chicks. There's just too many irons in the fire. Too many things to do to try and, and hatch my own birds or create my own line. And it's, that's we talk a lot about Diego specifically in the online course about holistic context. That does not interest me at all. If you said you have to start breeding your own chickens, hatching your own chickens to keep in, in the chicken business, I'd say, I'm going to go do something else. Like, that just doesn't interest me. Um, if, it, if it interests you, by all means, go for it. It's just not something I want to do or something I'm interested in. Again, we talk a lot about holistic context in the course and what makes you tick. What makes me tick, uh, logistics and really my cows. Like... <laughs> My cows just, that's really what I'm all about. I mean, I still enjoy uh, the pigs a whole lot. You know, I enjoy the chickens mostly. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's where I'm at with that. So question about the course. If you're planning to start farming in one to two years, should you wait to purchase the course for business tax purposes, or can you do that sooner? I mean, to, I have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll let Diego – look, it's – you're saving 200 bucks right now. It's probably not going to save you $200 on your taxes in two years. That's my thought. But Diego, I'll let you address that. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to it, when you look at the IRS code for tax code and talk to a CPA about this, you can have a business or a hobby. Now, you can write off some hobby expenses if you're selling some of that product. If you're not doing anything and you're just in startup, there's no sales, now you're in this startup phase. So what I would do is talk to a CPA accountant and I would ask them this specific question. I want to start this business in X months. In order to start that business, I need to do some R&D. Part of my R&D is buying books. It's buying courses. If I don't have any sales, can I write that off? Because conceivably, you know, there's some businesses or opportunities you may research and they're just a no-go from the start but you have to outlay some money to do it. The other thing you'd want to think about is maybe you already have an existing business structure. Like say you already have a farm and you raise beef and now you're thinking about, well, I'm going to raise pasture poultry. I haven't raised any yet. I'm just vetting that out. So you really got to look at the nuance there, hobby versus business, see what a CPA thinks. And, you know, if you spend an hour consulting with a CPA at a hundred bucks and say you bought this course and some other books, if they said no, well, then you got to decide, do you, do you want to wait? Uh, do you want to do it without the tax write-off? Or if they say yes, well, now you have a hundred or thousand dollar tax write-off. So think about that, but I definitely talk with somebody and explain the situation of what you're trying to do and they'll be able to walk you through that. And, and before we go back down into the, the questions here, Darby, there's a different window with one came up and it's, I picked up an FFA book on how to raise chickens at Tractor Supply. Not sure if it's a good source. Would you recommend any other good books on pastured poultry? Uh, yeah, so 
Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, this is your Bible. Pastured poultry profits. I mean, I think this should be on your bookshelf. Um, it's still something I reference. Um, I think it's, I think it's a good resource. Uh, there's another book. I don't know if I've got my copy laying here. Yeah, this is a, this is a good book that Diego turned me on to. Um, this is your, uh, Pat, pasture poultry feeding by Jeff Maddox, pretty thin, uh, but all about feed, uh, grit, the management of, you know, that, that type of stuff. I think those are both good books that you should probably have if you're going to do poultry. Um, those are really the only two I could, I could recommend though. Here's one, John McCauley. He's a pasture poultry guard in North Carolina. Put me on to right here. You might be able to find it on Amazon used. It's 1954, but mostly just feed around poultry. It's, it's an interesting book to flip through, but if you're really interested in this subject, there's another one to add to the list. Yeah. Um, can you raise point of lay pullets in a system like this or start? Yeah, you could, you could, uh, you gotta have a market for those. So, you know, I mean, urban chickens are kind of a big thing right now. I mean, it's possible. Um, I've looked at that, but you can also <laughs> go buy started pullets for like, I, I've heard of guys buying started pullets that are, you know, four or five months old for like four or five bucks a piece. If you're going to buy a hundred of them, that's really hard to compete with. I think you got to have a niche. I think you got to have some nice heritage breeds. And I, I think you got to be willing to like almost drive those into the city, you know, and find the, the, the urban, uh, you know, gardener slash, I want six laying hens on my property and, and get them to pay real premium. Um, you know, it's not anything I've ever done. I, I guess there's a possibility you could do that. Uh, Diego, there's a question for you about, are you running any systems like this in Southern California? Yeah, and I told Ryan, I mean, the best place to go for that is Primal Pastures. They're the, the standard down here. And they have the small chicken tractor, Salatin style, and then they have the larger hoop house style. And then just a the follow-up that he had in there, you know, are, are there a lot of regulations on butchers? Why are there so few? Why do you have to drive so far for them? Yeah, um, when it comes to poultry, because it's really, really, really hard work. Um, I think that's why there are so few – uh, and, and most of them around here are Amish. They're hardworking Amish families. Um, you know, not, there's not a whole lot of regulation. It's just it, the economies of scale, the vertically integrated agricultural machine has, has put a lot of butchers out of business. In my region, central Indiana, okay, there used to be two or three family-owned butchers per county about 40 years ago. Mom and pop places that would butcher pretty much anything. Uh, now we're down to a ratio of about one butcher in every three counties. So we've seen a reduction of six, seven, eight hundred percent in two generations. That's due to vertical integration. Uh, and so on poultry, it's taken even a bigger toll. Um, but they are coming back. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for people like if you wanted to have a pastured poultry business and custom butcher chickens for others, like if you're willing to work, if you can get a, a good crew together, uh, you know, Diego and I have got a, a podcast coming up with a guy that um, does his own butchering on farm. And, you know, that's, that's like, if I was him, that's something I'd be thinking about because butchers are hard to find. So, you know, it could be a business opportunity. I think mobile processing, like if you told me tomorrow that you were going to start a mobile processing system and you'd be willing to ride my farm, like I would pay you handsomely. To, to come do that so uh well, here's two questions that tie into that combining to on-farm processing versus using a butcher are you leaving money on the table or your sanity and then the, the follow-up question to that is you know what are you paying for bird to get them butchered which ties into that yeah so um legally i can do it we can in indiana we can butcher up to twenty thousand birds on farm uh and sell them in any any way we want um, am I leaving money on the table? Technically, yeah, kind of like, am I leaving money on the table by not farrowing my own pigs? There are only so many hours in the day. From a contextual standpoint, I am not pro-employee, okay? I don't want to have to get a crew of people together uh, to do this. I, where I excel is on the production side and on the marketing side. Um, and, and I, again, I don't have an interest in butchering. We did it the very first time. Why? Cause I'm an, I told you I'm an engineer. I'm pragmatic. 
this book tells you to go butcher your own chickens. So that's what I did. And I was very thankful for the experience. And we got done that day. And my wife said, what did you think? And I said, I think if we're going to do this again, we're going to hire a butcher. And if we can't hire a butcher, we're not going to do it again. Because I don't want to butcher chickens. It's just not what I'm into. Uh, it's not cheap to go buy that equipment and get a, get a setup. Now, will it save you money in the long term? Yes, it absolutely will. Contextually, if that's something you're into, I say go for it. Um, it's just not something I want to do. The cost per bird for me, it's three bucks. And I get a very, very nice vacuum sealed, professionally dressed bird that I'm proud of and can, can hand over to anyone. Uh, we've had our chicken served in the nicest restaurants in the city of Indianapolis. They are very professionally done and it's $3 a bird. And it, for me, that's just what jives. And that's, that, that's where all this little nuance kind of starts to, to come in. You know, how close is the nearest butcher? Do you want a butcher on farm? Are you allowed to butcher on farm or your state laws? And that's where what works for one person doesn't work for the next person. And you just, you know, you got to do what works for you. Here's on, uh, is temperature range, is there a temperature range that pasture poultry should not be outdoors and or out of the brooder? Uh, I'm not quite sure I fully understand that question. Um, meaning... When's too cold to be on pasture and when? Yeah, so uh, anything below 40 degrees, adult birds really struggle, okay? I wouldn't want to put my birds out on pasture if the nighttime lows were going to get sub 55 degrees, ideally. Uh, sub, sub 50, you know, they got to be really feathered out. Um, it, yeah, I mean, that's ideally. Ideally, you know, you get big temperature swings in the spring. What I've found here, every spring is getting colder and rainier and staying that way longer. We actually had hypothermia issues last year on like May 5th, May 6th, uh, 35 degrees, inches of rain. I pushed my production back a couple of weeks this year because that's just the trend we're seeing right now in my region at least. Uh, colder, wetter, uh, not warmer and drier contrary to what you hear on the news. Um, so, but yeah, sub 50 degrees, they really struggle. Uh, so be careful there. Um, yeah. Uh, John, no, I have not joined the APPPA. Um, what do I belong to farming wise, farmer to consumer legal defense fund? And that's it. Um, I don't know. I just, I haven't investigated joining them. I, I guess I don't know what the benefits are. I haven't taken the time to look. So, uh, let's see, feed mills. Uh, okay, so when you're first starting out, I think whatever you can get at the farm store is fine. If you're gonna run 50 or 100 birds, they're probably gonna have something that's gonna work for you. It boils down again to that holistic context. If you want to be GMO free or organic or soy free, most farm stores, they, they might have a GMO free option may be an organic option, but mostly they're going to have a conventional soy, corn, medicated feed option. That's probably what you're going to see. So that kind of boils down to context. I personally, um, I haven't written a guide on this yet. I probably will. I think I'm committing to that now. <laughs> um, uh, I think you approach working with a feed mill the same you approach working with a butcher. Um, the thing with poultry, if you're butchering off farms, like you're very dependent upon your feed mill, your butcher, your hatchery, you're partnering with them. And I have a very long relationship with my, the grain mill I, I, I work with, I was actually there today, it's 50 miles from my farm. Uh, I've been working with them since 2008, so 10 years. And I actually thought about that when I walked in there today. I've been coming here for 10 years of my life. Um, I can just text Denny and say, I need X, Y, Z next Tuesday. And it shows up and I know what the cost is. We've just got a very good relationship. And I, I, that's something I cherish. I, I really don't shop him a whole lot. The numbers work. We make money as I've demonstrated, make 50 bucks an hour on production. Um, so I, I personally, if you think you're going to do this long term, 
Now, if you're homesteading and it's like, ah, I'm going to raise 40 birds and see if it's for me, eh, whatever you can find. I mean, it's, it's a heck of a lot better than what you're eating. I don't care if it's, frankly, Whole Foods or Walmart or anything in between. What you're going to raise at home is going to be better. But I think if you're serious about this for production, I would start reaching out to some feed mills and kind of check pricing and work with them and see how flexible they are on making custom mixes for you. I know there's been a couple of times, I, you know, I've had some issues with the feed and, you know, they've picked it up and reground it for me and brought it back to me because uh, it was just too chunky. I talked about that in the presentation, like, you know, it needs to be finely ground and um, that's, that's really important. So I, I'm all for approaching feed mills and, and building a relationship just like you would with a butcher or uh, a supplier or somebody that's throwing pigs for you, anything else. Uh, okay, scroll down here. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. Do uh, you feel the need to be near a large city to market your birds? Something I teach in the course is if you are going to direct sell stuff via a farmer's market and that, that's something I do. I know not everyone's into that. If you go back and listen to the podcast we did with Charles Mayfield down in Tennessee, uh, he did $30,000 in business last year, his first year in business and never set foot in a farmer's market. Doesn't want to set foot in a farmer's market. He lives in a very rural part of Tennessee and he's, he's got people coming to him. So I, I, I don't think you have to, I, I think there are advantages if you're closer to larger cities. Um, I think you got to be willing to drive. And something I, I talk about is like, if you've got to drive an hour and a half or two hours to get into a major metropolitan area, that's just part of it. You factor that in, you factor that into your time, your labor, uh, what you've got to earn per hour. Um, now if you're six hours or something crazy out West from a city that's got a hundred thousand people, you know, I, that becomes more of a struggle. Certainly. I, I think maybe at that point you start looking at co-ops you can work with, uh, you know, selling, uh, probably more direct into, uh, stores and, uh, supermarkets, uh, restaurants, things of that nature. The thing is, when you're out like that, the advantage, everybody's got, and this is something else I talked about in the course, everybody's got an unfair advantage. And you've got to look at that unfair advantage, recognize it, and, and use it to your advantage. So what's my unfair advantage? I'm 35 minutes from downtown Bloomington and I'm an hour from anywhere in Indianapolis. I've got a lot of people in a very short distance from my farm. My disadvantage is that land around me is selling for 10 to $13,000 an acre. If you're way out, um, you know, Luke Gross, who has been on Diego's YouTube channel that I talk with sometimes, he's just down in Southern Indiana. He's like, what, Diego, three hours from me? Yeah. You know? He bought a seven bedroom house with 20 acres and outbuildings for just a little over a hundred thousand dollars. So what's his unfair advantage is the cost of land, right? So you can produce more and you can sell it more of a wholesale margin. So I, I think, you know, is it nice? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it really depends on, again, on that whole, there's so much I can't even get into here, assessing your market and uh, you know, trying to figure out, well, and then on top of that, my personal context, like what works for me, what works in our life, you know, what just, you've got to figure that all out. And that's why it looks similar, but different for every farm. Um, so I, I don't think it's a must, but uh, it, it's, it's got unique challenges, but it's also got distinct advantages too. Yeah. Um, what sorts of resources do you use for weather prediction? Uh, <laughs> predicting the weather in Indiana. Are you serious? Uh, if you don't like the weather today, come back tomorrow. It'll be different. Um, that's, that's tough. I mean, we've, I, I've literally personally experienced a 110 degree swing in seven days in the state of Indiana. No joke. No joke. Um, it's crazy. Minus 50 degree wind chills. And seven days later, it was 60 degrees outside. So yeah, I, you, you, I, I talk a lot about this when you're first starting out. Uh, I don't care what you're raising, pigs, chickens, whatever, like work with nature. If you're going to go start pigs, for instance, start in May, finish in October. Just make it easy on yourself. Same with chickens. Start in May. 
you know, or start, start them in beginning of September, finish in October, like just make it easy on yourself. Uh, there's really not much of a way to do that, uh, at least here. Uh, no, no vaccination on birds. I don't medicate them. If they get sick, they die. Just being honest. We will reactively treat a pig or a cow if it's an acute thing we can treat and save its life. Uh, or if we have one that has worms or something like that, we will, but not with chickens. We don't do anything. Uh, I raise a slower growing Cornish cross. And I mean that genuinely, this particular line has not been doctored with in 30 years. If I had to use a standard Cornish cross, I probably would have quit. Um, they're a moving target. Big bird world says, hey, we need the chickens to do this. And the guys in lab coats go re-engineer that bird to do that. And then you got to play catch up and figure them out. And it's a moving target. Uh, I worked with, with uh, Schlecht Hatchery out of Eastern Iowa, very small family owned mom and pop place. And the birds are static. She's got them under a perpetual uh, license as I understand it. Uh, so they don't get doctored. And uh, from year to year to year, the birds are the same. I figured out the management on them and I love them. I love them. You got to give them an extra three to seven days, but beyond that, they, they are fantastic. Um, I've never done the Rangers. I think we're getting to a point here and I've talked a lot about this, like food culture plays a lot into that. So if I were in Southern California, uh, or someplace else that was a bit more progressive with food, um, in Portland, Oregon, I think you could, you could do that. And I, like, I think we could raise them here. I know Luke has done this somewhat. Um, but it's still different enough that your average soccer mom in a parking lot on Saturday morning is going to look at that Red Ranger and be like, what? I've never seen a chicken that looks like that. What's wrong with it? That's the standard response you're going to get. Um, so I think we're getting there, but I've not tried them yet. Uh, how many birds through how many cycles per season? I do a minimum of 500. Um, I've done as many as six batches in a year. Uh, this year, we're doing three batches at 600. Next year, we might scale that back up. I've had to scale down poultry production a little bit this year. One, because I wanted to. <laughs> uh, and, and two, because, uh, frankly, this course has taken hundreds of hours of time. And uh, we'll continue to take a lot of time this summer. So that time had to come from somewhere. So we uh, scaled up our batch size a little bit and, and cut out a batch. Um, that also filled some boxes with check marks on the personal context side of being able to take a break, be able to take a, a family trip in the summer, uh, things of that nature. So that all depends. Um, I think starting out, you just do a, a, a you know batch of 100. And if it goes well, like if you're serious about this, then I think you invest in the chicken tractors and the crates, and that's the big expense, and you, you scale this up. If you've got a driver, and even if you don't have to drive very far, I'm telling you that spreadsheet does not lie. I mean, literally another $10 an hour, just going from 400 to 500 birds. That was the only thing that changed in that example I showed you. Notice again, those are real numbers. Um, let's see, webinar on Saturday, Diego, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. Yep, yep. That had to slot in behind Brickworld, which I'm taking my youngest son to because he's a Lego maniac uh, in downtown Indy. So that's why that was a little bit later. Uh, yes, it will be recorded as well. Yep, of course. Uh, here's one other question that came in through like a Q&A thing. Uh, it, it's Mary or Mart is asking, you know, was this recorded? It will be, it is recorded and I'll email everybody afterwards with the link to where you can watch that. Okay. Uh, what other animals do we cover in the course? So uh, what we cover in the course, uh, pasture broilers, pastured turkeys, uh, our pigs, which we raise in more of a forest system. Uh, if you want to raise them on pasture, that's fine. We cover pigs and we cover 100% grass-fed beef. Um, we cover those things because that's what I can speak on at an expert level. I'd be, be, uh, I'd be disingenuous if I tried to teach you about goats or, or anything else. So uh, those are the, the three main things we cover right now. Um, 
you know, we, we have aspirations of covering more in the future, but uh, initially that's, that's what we cover. That is kind of the perfect three. Honestly, if you get into livestock, no matter where you go, most Americans will eat at least, if they eat meat, they will eat at least two of those three animals. Um, and it's, it's very easy to find butchers for them. If you start getting into some other stuff, it can get a little bit more difficult. All right, that clears out the board. So thanks again for coming. Be sure to check out grassfedlife.co for all the free resources, for more information on the course, farmbusinessessentials.com. Stay tuned for the email with the recap on this one. And then I hope to see everybody here on Saturday. Both Darby and I will be here. I'll be doing the presentation. So bring your question and your attention, and I'll see you then. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, everybody.